season one of Off the Dribble, the Byron Scott podcast is brought to you by Neff Paco. Well, hello there. It's just me and the world's best tasting vodka. Guys, this is your boy B. Scott. This is another edition of Off the Dribble. I'm here with another one of my teammates, one of my favorite people. And uh, this man introduced, introduced me to going out of California and really enjoying myself seeing this beautiful uh, water way back in the day. And this man was the number one pick in the 1978 draft, uh, two-time NBA champion, no other than my boy Michael T. Thompson. MT, thank you, brother, for joining the show. How you doing? Well, first, I have to correct you. Okay, what you going to correct me on? I am an eight-time NBA champion. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you just say eight? Eight times. No, no, I'm talking about two that you won when we played, not the ones that your son won mm-hmm. or, or, or high school. And two or, as, a, uh, as an announcer. Oh, okay, okay. So well, I, go, go ahead, correct me. Yeah, now. three as an announcer, excuse me. I okay. Like to, I like to count all those rings because you saw the rings in the back there. I, I did. Saw, uh, real rings, right? So I've got two as a player, uh-huh. three as an annu- Laker announcer, uh-huh. so and that's three five. as a Golden State Warrior dad. Okay. I, I added that, all that, up. That, that's, that's eight, eight. baby, eight. <laughs> and we're going to get our ninth. <laughs> I'm gonna get my ninth this year because I. The wait, wait, wait. Gonna, oh, okay. I'm about to say yeah. Golden State. Oh no, no you're talking the about the Lakers. Lakers okay. are loaded this year. Man. Yeah, I think yeah. Good, uh, good. God willing to have good health, they're gonna win it this year. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And I've told people on a number of occasions that if the Lakers stay healthy this year, mm-hmm. they will be the NBA champions again. If they would have stayed healthy last, last year, year. Byron, uh, Anthony Davis went down. Once yeah. Anthony Davis went down, that was it. It was over. It was, it was over. over. MT, I want to ask you a little bit about the Bahamas. We all know that you grew up in the Bahamas, and I know how beautiful the Bahamas was. I was a, uh, a resident, <laughs> I, it seems like, for 20-plus years straight that I went after every game or after every season that we had, yeah. we would always end up in the Bahamas and enjoying the beautiful uh, festivities that was going on. What was it like growing up in the Bahamas? Yeah, we call you Byron the Bahamian. Cause That's you right. Got, uh, your off-seasons <laughs> came down there and you were like a Bahamian boy. Say, Everybody you know, would say, welcome home. Exactly. Welcome home, you Byron. Right and you and Magic. And uh, matter of fact, the Bahamas is kind of like the NBA's playground. Yeah. A lot of guys go over there and have like um, like unofficial camps just to get together and train as a team and, and hang out as a team. But growing up in the Bahamas, man, I tell you, obviously it's a different uh, culture, a different country. Yet it's very close uh, to the United States, the, probably the closest country overseas to the United States, because mm-hmm. it's closer than Cuba is, mm-hmm. Bimini being only 50 miles away. So we were under the British influence or a society, culture, whatever, because we were a British Commonwealth. But yet we were highly influenced by American culture, too. Mm-hmm. Music, dress, mm-hmm. cars, television stations. So I had the best of both worlds. And uh, I tell you, growing up in Bahamas, Byron, was a, it was a blessing because my father was a Great provider, mm-hmm. great father, my mother of two, of course. We had a good family. And uh, as you know, going to the Bahamas and everybody, a lot of people listening to us right now, have been to the Bahamas and realized it is paradise down there. Right. So I grew up, I was like a black Gilligan growing up in, pa- <laughs> growing up in paradise down there, man, on my little island. A black island. Gilligan? Black Gilligan. Oh, okay, little, okay. Little on my own private little island down there. That's what now, it felt like. So I, but, I had a privileged lifestyle growing up. But like MT, this. you know, Gilligan wasn't the brightest dude in the world. So I don't know if you want to compare yourself to, to, to Gilligan by saying you were the black Gilligan. You might want to pick somebody a little bit different that had some sense. Because well, you got you got sense. Gilligan wasn't the smartest true. dude on the island. Well, I wasn't smart like the professor. Okay. I, All right. I wish I could have been Thurston Howell III <laughs> and, had, and had his money. <laughs> I'd like to have been that. But, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, and I wasn't a skipper out because I wasn't in charge because I was the second youngest of six siblings. So seven siblings. So uh, um, or seven kids. <laughs> so I guess I was just basically, I guess. Let's see. I wasn't. I guess I could have been like Marianne, you know, because even though I wasn't a girl, she had a lot of common sense. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I was the male version of Marianne. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> so you you come out in seventy nine or uh, seventy eight. I'm sorry. You first player pick. Mm-hmm. You are the first foreign player. That's right. Ever to be drafted in the NBA at the number one pick. How did that feel? I feel like I'm the father of the foreigners. Yeah. I mean, you kind of trade. You know, planted that seed for everybody. Was, now it's it's a. It's a Every year occurrence is not a mm-hmm. big deal anymore because so many foreign players have come over here and succeeded and, uh, and, and, and done so well. But back in my day, talking about 1978, that was a rarity. It was right. rare. It was strange to have a kid born outside the United States be the number one pick in the draft. That was unheard of back in those days. Right. Now it's commonplace. Right. But uh, yeah, I was pretty, uh, I'm honored to be that first guy, even though people don't remember it, but still some people like the, the old timers like us, we remember that and it is an honor and yeah. a privilege and 
And a very special feeling to know that I was the first one. Yeah, that, that's, that is special to know yeah. that you were the first one. I, I got to ask you this question because I've been, I've been wondering this for years. And all the years that we played together and known each other, I've never asked you this question. You, you leave the Bahamas and you go to University of Minnesota oh. where it's cold as hell. Yeah. Bahamas is paradise, nice and warm. How much they pay you to go to the University of Minnesota? It had to be a bunch of money because there's no way in hell a Bahamian like yourself was going to go to a university like that without getting something. A lot of people ask me that question. Why would you leave Miami, Florida, or the Bahamas? And I went to high school in Miami, Florida. I left Miami in January to go off my recruiting trip to Minnesota. I left Miami. It was 80 degrees. When I landed in Minneapolis, it was 16, not <laughs> six zero, one six. And all I had was a little cotton sweater on. You weren't ready for that, were you? Ooh, I couldn't believe. That's the first time I'd ever seen snow. I couldn't believe people lived in those temperatures. Yeah, yeah. So people said, well, what made you decide to leave the, the tropics of Miami and the Bahamas to go up in the uh, Nordic and the frigid and the <laughs> North Pole of Minnesota? And what did they have to pay you? And uh, I can honestly say nothing. Let me tell you how it was. I... <laughs> Maybe I was being naive. I was 18 years of age. You know, at 18, are you really thinking about money? I mean, we all like it. But we're 18, Bob. We're just thinking about playing ball and going to frat parties or going to parties on the weekend. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. No. I, I give you that. You got to remember, too, this is 1974. 19, yeah, 1974. So back in those days, at least me, I wasn't as sophisticated as kids are today. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, to kids today that grew up in the AAU system, they think about being recruited when they're 10 years old. They think about being an NBA player when they're 10 years of age because they grew up in this new final era of basketball where everything's on social media. You're getting hyped up as the number one 10-year-old in the country, number one 12-year-old. But back in 1974, nobody was talking right, that way. Right. We, were, we lived a more simplistic lifestyle. You know, you came along later, but even in your era, were you thinking about being a pro when you were 12 or were people recruiting you like you were going to be a pro? You had an entourage of 12, 14 years of age like kids have today? No. This is 1974, 30, 40 something, years, 50 years ago. So no, back then, I just wanted to go someplace to play basketball and not even think about getting stuff under the table. Now, stuff was being offered under the table by, from other guys, I'm of course, sure. Of course. But I, I never really even thought to ask for it. You know, because during the years you'd be in college, you'd hear things about some guys getting paid off or... You hear about recruiting trips and stuff like that. But when I, I was so naive, I didn't even think about asking for it. I right. just wanted to go up to Minneapolis, see what it was like, and enjoy the experience. Went to a couple of parties, had a little bit too much to drink, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're going to get into this guy a little bit later, too, because I, I want to I bring him up. But, but Kevin McHale yeah. was one of your teammates um, who ended up being a Hall of Famer. You know, great. So, so your front court was, was amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trent Tucker was Trent on that Trent team as well. He came a couple came of years couple later, years right? Later, yeah. So I mean, you end up playing with Kevin over the years. Now, now that starting five was Ray Williams and Flip yes, Saunders. Ray, yes, Ray yes, former New York Nick, great player, and uh, Flip Saunders. Obviously, everybody knows who Flip Saunders was our starting point guard. Mm -hmm. One of those typical college point guards, smart, could shoot. He was like a poor man's version of John Stockton. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't play mm -hmm. in the NBA, but he had, had that kind of style of play. Me, Kevin McHale. And Osborne Lockhart was, my, was our other, other guard. So we were like three guards and then Kevin McHale and me up front. And Kevin McHale came in as a freshman. And I was a junior when he came in. And he was a freshman. And I could tell he could play right away. He was skilled. Mm -hmm. Typical big man back in those days. Good back-to-the-basket skills. Cocky as all get out. Yeah. But in a yeah. good way. Right. You know, you wouldn't right. think this kid's just a freshman. He's just outgoing, great personality. Would go out there and score on me or any upperclassman like it's nothing because he was so skilled. Gangly, tall, mm -hmm. long, looking like Eddie Munster. Yeah, you know, but, uh, he could play even as a freshman. I said, "Boy, this boy can play." Right. No, Kevin. Kevin was he was a monster. But you know what though? I did not think he was going to be in the Hall of Famer, and as great as he was. Yeah. Now he went to the right team at the Boston Celtics. Would he have been as great playing in Milwaukee or playing in Philadelphia? Right. Maybe. Right. Right. Probably would have been, but he wouldn't have got all the. Uh, accolades because he played for a great dynast dy dynastic team, like how you got to play for the, the dynastic Lakers. And that obviously enhanced and, and helped him uh, improve his game even more, playing with Robert Parrish and Larry Bird and Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge. Yeah, I mean... So he when, exceeded my expectations. Yeah, when, when you see it... And, and again, it goes back to a lot of being in the right place at the right oh, time. Yeah. And, and Kevin obviously got with a team. Uh, Red Auerbach saw something in him like you, you saw when he was a freshman that they felt could take him to another level. Right. Now I want to go back to, you know, you, you play for the Portland Trailblazers. You go to San Antonio. I think it's in that order. Right. And then we make a trade with San Antonio to get you to come to the Los Angeles Lakers. 
Uh, and I remember the first time we, we we had you at the gym, you were in the gym in the dark with Bill Burka on the floor. Sunday morning. Sunday morning before a national televised game that we're about to play. Yeah, some team. What team was that again? Yeah, I think I think it was that team in green and white, yeah, if I remember they correctly. They, they wasn't bad. Yeah, they weren't bad. But that trade that day, I mean, what did it feel like for you to be traded to the Lakers? I couldn't believe it at first when they first told me because, like I said, this is 1987. Oh, 86. So back then, we didn't have the means of communication like mm-hmm. we have today. They mm-hmm. couldn't text you on your phone. You didn't right, have cell phones. Right, right. So I went to, I was in San Antonio, went home. We had a game that night. So I went and took my phone off the hook so I could take a pregame nap mm-hmm. because we had, we had line, we had landlines back then. Landlines. Right, right. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I took my phone off the hook so nobody would call me and wake me up for a couple hours. And so I got up, took a shower, put my phone back on the hook and just drove to the, uh, to the, to, the, to the arena, Hemisphere Arena, the old right. Hemisphere oh, yeah. Arena. Oh, yeah. And uh, during that time that I was taking a nap, people were trying to call me right. from the Spurs hey, to tell me, Michael, you've been traded to the Lakers. Don't bother you not to come to the game tonight. But I didn't know, so I just got up and went to the game anyway. And I was, me and Alvin Robinson were always the first uh, guys to get to the arena. You remember Alvin Robinson? Oh, yeah. Alvin's oh, yeah. Player. That boy was good. Funny, funny guy, too. Tough. So, yeah, he was tough. Yeah. Great, great defender. He was like, a, yes. he was like a, a version of Russell Westbrook, that yeah. type of player. Yeah. yeah. Very athletic like that and fast. So we were the first ones to get to the arena that night, which I, I got there like three hours before game time. I walk into the arena, into the locker room. The trainer, John Anderson, was there. It was a big time kidder, a lot like Gary Beatty, former mm-hmm. Laker uh, mm-hmm. uh, trainer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, John Anderson was like that, too. always kidding around, always joking around. You never knew when he was serious. So he looks at me and I walk in. He goes, what the? Can I, you can't curse on these things. Yeah, you can. Well, I don't <laughs> curse anyway. But he said, what the F word are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm just, I'm usually here this time every day. He says, oh, you're not an F in Spur anymore. Get the F out of here. No, he didn't. Yeah. So, of but course, you thought he was joking. Yeah, I thought yeah. He was joking. Yeah. Right. Said, oh, yeah, right. And I got to my locker. He goes, uh, where's my uniform? I said, the, you know, he starts cussing me out. And I thought he was serious. I thought I didn't know he was serious. And now we traded your bleepity bleep to the Lakers. <laughs> I said, yeah, right. He says, where's my uniform? I just want to get dressed, okay, and get ready for the game. And he kept insisting I got traded. I didn't believe him until somebody finally from the Spurs front office came and says, no, Michael, we just traded you to the Lakers. Wow. I was like, what? Wow. Oh, my goodness. Now, listen, I had a good time in San Antonio, but we weren't going to win a championship. Right, we weren't right. going to beat you guys. Right. We weren't even hardly going to make the playoffs. But I had I loved playing with Alvin Robinson and Johnny Moore. Yeah. Artis Gilmore yeah. was on the team. Kevin Duckworth was a rookie there when I was there, but he got traded a couple of months before. Uh, Mike Mitchell was there, mm-hmm. David Greenwood. So I, I enjoyed playing with those guys, even mm-hmm. though we weren't a great team. So I wasn't really looking to leave. I figured this is my lot in life. I'll enjoy my time in San Antonio Spurs. They had great chicken fried steak down there, <laughs> good uh, Me- Tex-Mex food coming next to L.A. That's where you can find the best Mexican food. So I was enjoying my time in San Antonio. But when they finally convinced me that I got traded to my boyhood favorite team, because I grew up a Jerry West, Gail Goodrich, and Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor wow, fan in the Bahamas. Wow, wow. And the Lakers was always my team. Even when I was in the Blazers, I was a fan of you guys. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to beat you, but I figured if we can't win, I hope the Lakers win, which you right. guys always, always did anyway. <laughs> and we never could beat you guys. So when I finally got a chance to play with my idol that I grew up watching, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, I'm going to be a Laker. And I knew how good you guys were anyway. And I was nowhere close to ever winning the championship. I said, this is my chance to win a ring. Oh, I couldn't believe my good fortune and how blessed I was. And when John Anderson and the Spurs finally convinced me that I was actually no longer a Spur, but now a member of the L.A. Lakers, man, I remember John, I see the speed limits like 60 miles an hour back then. I must have driven back to my apartment and maybe like 105 miles an hour to get my stuff and get on the first plane out the next morning to get to L.A. I couldn't believe it, my good fortune and how blessed I was to get traded to the Lakers. But boy, getting traded to the Lakers... That's a whole different level. Yeah. That's a whole different thing. I was in the NBA for eight years at that time, playing with the Blazers, playing with the Spurs. A lot of pressure on you to win, a lot of pressure on you to perform. But when you join the Lakers, it's a whole different, it's a whole different level you move to. Because now you don't only hope to win, you are expected right. That's to right. win. That's right. That's a whole different pressure on yeah. a player. Well, I tell you, I, I remember and that. I never experienced anything like that at that Yeah, level. yeah, yeah. Well, I know, I know what you're saying, because obviously for me, luckily, you know, being there as a rookie. Yeah. You know, and, you and under, I was I was kind of pushed into it. So I understood from that time on that this is expected, right. winning championship. Yeah. And I remember again, like I said, rem- I remember Bill Burker out there with you talking to you about what we do on the bo- on the offensive end and the defensive end. You played a game with us that day and we have a great game. We beat the Celtics. And of, of course, we face them I again. Had, I had 10 points, five rebounds and two blocks. Not that I remember. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it's, I mean, it's only uh, what about 36, 30 some years ago, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's been a while, but but anyway, I remember you. You used to always brag about a, a whole lot of things, but one thing you bragged about that we found out to be true was that the reason we couldn't beat the Celtics in '84 is because we just couldn't guard Kevin McHale. Kevin was just such a dominant force on that on that post, uh, and Kareem had to deal with Robert Parrish. Right. And AC and Kirk, you know, who obviously they, they played their butts off and played as hard as they could. They just didn't have the length for Kevin. And he just was a thorn in our side. And I remember when we got you in the trade, the one thing that you said to us, you know, guys, don't worry about Kevin. I got him one-on-one. I, I can guard him. I know him yeah. extremely well. So don't worry. We don't have to double-team right. him. And boy, oh, boy, when we play him in 80, uh, 85 and you shut him down, or was it 87? 87. 87. 80, 87 and you were able to guard him one on one. We was like, wow, you know, because we hadn't seen that. We hadn't, we hadn't seen anybody that was able to guard him. You played with him in college, so you knew him extremely well. And what was that like to come in and be that voice, you know, that boisterous and say, I can guard this guy? That's number one. And number two, to deliver and we win the championship. Yeah, like I said, man, when you joined the Lakers, so much pressure came along with it because you are expected to. As Bill Belichick says, do your job. Yeah. Pat Riley yeah. treated us like men and made sure we were and we wanted to make, we held each other accountable. You had to deal with Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge. Yeah. So you had your hands full. So I couldn't, uh, James had to deal with Larry Bird. Yeah. <laughs> like you said, Kareem had to deal with Robert Paris. So if I got McHale and I got to step up, I can't expect these guys to help me because they got their hands full already. Right. So they got to be worried <laughs> about me too. So I knew that I, I had to come down there and I knew that's why they brought me here to help out against that great Celtic front line. And uh, Bill Walton was there too. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Arguably the greatest front line in history of the game. Yeah. And so I knew that since they bought me here and depending on me to uphold my end of the bargain, I, I had to make sure that I had to make sure and uh, do my job. That's why I used to get over to Gold's Gym, even after our hard practices, to just work out instead of try to get as strong as I could. Well, I, I tell you what, MT was uh, very strong back in the day. I mean, th this dude was extremely strong. He was great, great post defender. Um, and I can tell you guys, honest to goodness, true. We don't win the 87 and the 88 championship if we don't have this man on the team because he contributed on both ends of the floor. Uh, and he was just such a great teammate. We had a lot of laughs in the locker room, too. So I'm going to take a drink because I didn't early and yeah. MT is going to drink later. But I'm going to take a sip. A little sugar cane rum from the Bahamas. Of the rum from the Bahamas little from my man, M MT. And, and we talked about those championships. Now I'm going to segue into personal life. You know, we like like we said, we we've, we've grown up together, and we watch our kids grow up together. You have three three boys. You and Julie have three boys, and uh, have done an unbelievable job with all of them. I know most people know of Clay. Uh, a lot of people probably don't know as, uh, know Michael as well, and, and Trace as well. But you've had three boys that's been very successful. You know, tr I mean, Clay obviously the most successful of your kids with the two championships with Golden State. How does that make you three, three. three championships? Should have been four. Yeah, should we, have been well, five. well, we should have, well, you got eight rings. We, we, should, have, <laughs> we should have two more, yeah, yeah, to right. be honest with you. But how do you feel? I know, I know it makes you proud, but just give us a little bit of an indication on how you feel as a dad to have three sons that you and Julie raised to be so successful. Well, the best thing, you know, you're a father yourself, the, the, and any parent listening to us right now, it's not so much what kind of success your kids have in their careers. Obviously, that's really important, but the kind of people they turn out yeah, to be. Yeah. That's the most important yeah. thing. And my three boys are uh, really good young men. They're very caring young men, respectful young men, of, respectful of others, caring of others. And that's what we're most proud of. Yes, we all know about uh, Clay's professional accomplishments. Clay, Trace right now is playing with the Chicago Cubs. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, he'll be with them again next year. But we like the young men that they've turned out to be. They're very conscientious of other people's feelings and uh, people who are less fortunate than them. And that's what I like about them so much is they have good hearts. Yeah. And they yeah. care about other people too, not just themselves. And they understand and appreciate how blessed they were as kids growing up in the homes that they had. And they would like to see other kids have the same experiences and opportunities that they've had. Mm -hmm. So that's what I like most about them. Obviously, we can talk about their professional success before Michael got to play with you and Cleveland yeah, for yeah, a minute. Yeah. He made the Cavs for a minute and he was, uh, he's, we still talk about that. And he tried to get back to the NBA, but it didn't work out for him through the G League. But uh, he's now working with Clay and, and Clay's corporation uh, with his shoe company and other adventures that Clay's in. Trace, like I said, is a young man now and pursuing his baseball career. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, and, you know, kids, our kids aren't perfect. 
who, which kids right, are. Right, right, right. But uh, we're very, very blessed with the kind of young men that turned out to be. Yeah. How, how does it feel when you, you've been at the pinnacle, like you said, you, you've won championships, and now to enjoy it with your son, you know, on, on three different occasions, how, how was that like, you know, to be able to see Clay win championships and then you guys probably, you know, get together sometime, you know, either right after the championship or the day, you know, the day after or whatever, and get a, get a chance to spend time with each other and reflect back on when you won championships and now to enjoy it with him. How does that feel? That's a great question. People ask me that all the time. Says, what's what are you happiest about your championships with the Lakers or the fact that Clay was able to get his and I said, come on, are you kidding me? There's no comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Uh, I would much rather, not, not, I, no, I don't expect you, I would rather lose mine so my son can have his. Yeah. Because no matter what you do in life as a parent listening to us right now, you want your kid to be more successful than you ever been, to have more success than you, to be happier in life than you ever been happy. That's what you want for your children. So I was thrilled. I'm blessed. I'm honored. Uh, it's special to have those Laker championship rings. But when Clay won his, that meant so much more to me because mm -hmm. my success is great. I appreciate it. I respect it. I love it. But to see a child realize his goal or, or their goals is much more rewarding than you recognizing your own or achieving your own goals. Yeah, I think as parents, you know, once you have once you have sons and daughters, uh, all of a sudden the focus is off of you. Right. You yeah, know, you, you all of a sudden start thinking yeah. about your family, your kids mm -hmm. and making sure that they have a better life than you had growing up. Right. You know, so I, yeah, I would have gave my three away in a heartbeat, yeah. you know, to see my son or my daughter have that type of success yes. as well. Yes. So that, that's a good thing. I already knew the answer because I know you, you know, I, I know Julie, I know y'all. So I, I wouldn't even sweat in that. People always ask me a tough question too. Lakers and Warriors in the Western Finals this year. Who am I pulling? Yeah, that's a good, you know what? That is a good question. And, uh, so, so what's the answer? Because <laughs> you work for the Lakers. I work for the Lakers. Right? I am a Laker. You're a Laker. You Lakers. will always be a Laker. So the what's Lakers, the answer? The Lakers have blessed me a million, a zig, infinity times over to be able to work, play for this organization. Now to work for this organization in the last 18 years, they've been so good to me. I'm so grateful and appreciative of the Lakers. I can't pay, repay them, if they, what they've done for my life. But if the Warriors and the Lakers are playing against each other this year in the Western Finals, which is a possibility, possibility yeah. if Clay yeah. can come back and be Clay, who do I want to win? How, my, the way I answer that is, I will be happy either way. <laughs> you know, that, that good? that's a politician answer right yeah, there. You just try, you're honestly, trying to, you're just, I, I want a Lakers or Warriors. I, I mean, I want a straight answer. Okay. Which one? Maybe this is the best way to put it. Professionally, I would be extremely happy. The Lakers won. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'll be really happy. <laughs> is, that, is that a good way to yeah, put it? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the best you, way you, to put so, it. So you still got admirations of, of, of being... Uh, the prime minister in the Bahamas after that answer, right? You, exactly, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Well, let's put it this way. If that happens, either way, I get my ninth ring. Well, that's, yeah, that, that's true. I think, you know what? I, I think you got a real good shot of getting your ninth ring. And, and I want to segue into that because you are. Watch out, Bill Russell. Hey, you're right. You're right. Because you, you are one of the voices of the Lakers. You work for the organi organization. You know the organization extremely well. You know the ins and out. Uh, the, the acquisitions that they made this summer. Mm -hmm. I look at it, and I've told people on a number of occasions, if they stay healthy, this team will win another championship. Do you think the same, number one, and, and number two, uh, who will have to sacrifice more with the new additions? Carmelo, I don't think, has to sacrifice because he's going to be coming off the bench. Right. Russell, LeBron, LeBron, I don't think, has to sacrifice because he's always been a facilitator. Right. AD. Who's got to sacrifice the most? Well, number one, they can win a championship, but they have to stay healthy. They're mm -hmm. very experienced. They've mm -hmm. got like seven, six or seven champions on this team in the roster. Maybe seven. I'll have to count it out. But so they have a lot of experience. Yes, they're older, but coaches today. I hope Pat Riley isn't watching this. <laughs> he, he, if I'm calling. He's gonna be one of the guests too. <laughs> well, make sure you delete this before he sees it. But coaches today have a. Good understanding of not overworking guys by the way they practice or don't practice or the amount of time they practice when they're there, maybe right. 90 minutes. Right. And right. I, I think that's great that Frank Vogel knows, and a lot of coaches know, knows how to manage these guys' practice time and allow them to get rest between mm -hmm. games. We didn't mm -hmm. do that, boy. Oh, my we God. We played the Celtics one night. The next day, we still got a three-hour practice. Wow. It yeah. Easy run and... Everybody on the baseline, <laughs> those two words, oh my goodness. Three line rush, oh, three yeah, man yeah. weave. Yeah, oh yeah. my goodness. But coaches today do a much better job of maintaining, uh, managing players' minutes in practice and on the floor. 
So even though they're old, I think Vogel's going to do a good job of limiting these guys in minutes played. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have such a deep team that LeBron doesn't have to play 36 minutes a game anymore. Mm -hmm. Neither does Anthony Davis, even though he's only 28, and he can do it. LeBron will probably play 30 because of their, the depth they have on his team. AD will probably average 33 a game. So because of that, the, the managing their minutes, they'll be able to be fresh going into the playoffs. And um, what was the other question about? Uh, about who, who has to sacrifice, oh, sacrifice the most? Yeah, It'll be Russell Westbrook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he's used to miss the triple-double, playing 36 minutes a game. Have probably ball taking in his hand 18 a lot, 20 yeah. shots. But you know what? That's not going to be a problem because he has so much respect for the other guys in this roster. Obviously, LeBron and AD and Carmelo, Hall of Famers, that he knows that he was brought here to be a to, to fit in mm -hmm. and not to dominate. Mm -hmm. Some nights he will dominate. Yeah. He'll have 20 points, 18 rebounds, and 17 assists. He'll do that, but he's not going to do it every night like he did at Oklahoma City or at, at Washington mm -hmm. because he knows he has so much help, he doesn't have to carry the team every night. Yeah, and he doesn't have to dominate the ball exactly. like, like, he's so, like he's been used to doing. Uh, I, I guess another one of the questions that I, that I wanted to ask you is about we, we hit on it a little bit, or you did, especially when you talked about players today and you talked about LeBron and you talked about the minutes that these guys are going to be playing. That kind of brings me to load management. Mm. What do you – I mean, we, we old school, mm. you know, and like, and like you just said a little while ago, we practice yeah. three hours a day, yeah. you know, no matter what. If we had four games in five nights, we were practicing three hours a day. Yeah. Um, and now you got guys that barely practice, and I agree with you as far as Frank – as far as limited their time in practice, you only need them on the floor for an hour, hour and a half. They get their work done, they get off their feet, right. get ready for the next game. But the load management, what do you think of load management in the NBA now? I can't stand it. If I was a commissioner, I would do something about it because there are ways to load manage your players, Brian. We just talked about it. You can limit their minutes. Mm -hmm. But you got to think about the customers. You got to think about the, the fans. Right. People now, that pay their money if you're to me, come watch you play. Yeah, if you're me coming off the bench, nobody cares. But if you're Magic Johnson, you're coming to see Magic Johnson, Byron, and Michael Cooper, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Kurt Rambis. Those guys are, are cult figures and cert, for certain teams. Those guys are the main players. You go you fast forward to today's games. When you have players like LeBron or Giannis and Kawhi, we all know Steph Curry. We all know those stars are. They are the reasons why people pay you to come see the right, game. Right. They don't care if Jordan Poole sits out. Even though I respect him and he's an NBA player, but if he's going to sit out tonight, it'd be, well, well, Jordan's not playing. But these families, they buy three, four, five tickets to take their kids to come see these superstars play. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to the game, hey, son, let's go. Let, when Clay was a little boy and the Sixers came to the town in Portland and Michael was a little boy, I said, come on, let's go. I got tickets for the Sixers game. I'm not going to the Sixers game to go see Aaron McKee. <laughs> I'm taking them to the Sixers game because they want to see Allen Iverson. Yeah, yeah. That's why they want to go. Right. And if they go to a game and Allen Iverson says, you know what, I'll take the night off. Uh, I'm just resting. Are you hurt? No, I decided not to play tonight. That's wrong. Yeah. Because you got to think of those fans up in section 300. This might be the only game a father or mother can afford to bring their kids to. Yeah. Let's yeah. go see LeBron play. Let's go see Anthony Davis play. Let's go see uh, uh, Paul George play. And if those guys are healthy, they have to have that recognition in their mind like Kobe had. Jordan had it. Jordan says, hey, I'm Michael Jordan. I'm Kobe Bryant. People are coming here to see me. Mm -hmm. So if I'm healthy, I'm going to play because people are paying their hard-earned money to come see me play. Yeah. They're not coming to see um, Scott Burrell play. Right, Scott Burrell, right. former, former Chicago. Right. They don't care if Luke Longley doesn't play. Right. But they care if Pippen <laughs> and Jordan play right. or Dennis Rodman. So – Back in those days, oh, I mean, if Magic's playing, that's why parents are bringing their kids to come see off, grown-ups to come to see the game. So if you are healthy, you play. And the way you load manage is, okay, if a guy's a little been playing every game, instead of playing 36 minutes a night, you'll play 24 minutes. Yeah, or just don't practice. Exactly. Yeah, the take, next day, take a day stay off home, practice. stay on the yeah. couch, take a day off watch Judge Judy. Right. And uh, really, you don't have to come to practice today, but just rest up for the game on Friday. You don't have to come to practice today. That's how you load manage, but... For games, if you're healthy, you got to play because you have a responsibility. If you are a star, because you have to recognize, if you're Joel Embiid, people are uh, Luka Doncic, you are the reason why people are coming to these games. Yeah. Yes, they're coming to support the team, but you are the focal point. You are the main attraction. So if you're healthy, you play because people are paying to see you play. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you mentioned you know, MJ and you mentioned Kobe because the last year I coached Kobe, you know, there, there were games where he was sick, wasn't even feeling well. And I would even tell him, I said, you know, KB, why don't you just take the night off, you know, because you don't feel well. You know, Gary said you got flu-like symptoms. And he was like, I can't. You know, I, I got to play. You know, these people paid their money to see, you know, to, wow. to come to the game. Yeah. I got to play. Yeah. You know, and, and he understood the responsibility yep. that he had 
as a basketball player to try to play every single night that he could yes, play yeah. if he's healthy enough to do it. Yeah. And, and I'm with you. I think we all feel the same way about low management. It's, it's a bunch of crock in that, you know, you know I, and I love Adam Silver. I think he's done an unbelievable job. But I think that's something he had to take a, you know, take a real hard look at because, again, those fans who are paying that money right. and then they go to the game and that player is not playing tonight, it, yeah. it does them a disservice. It breaks your heart, man. I remember I was going to, I went to a Dodger game. My son Trace, baseball, baseball f- a fan, he, he loved Ken Griffey. I mean, that's his idol. Just as much as I love Muhammad Ali growing up yeah, uh, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Dr. J, Ken Griffey was his idol. So we went, I got him tickets to a Dodger game and drove all the way to the Dodger Stadium from way down here in Orange County just to go see Ken Griffey. The Cincinnati Reds were in town, mm. but he didn't care about the Cincinnati Reds. Right. He only wanted to see Ken Griffey. Right. So we went to the Dodger game and we got there early and the guys were taking batting practice and they were out warming up and doing soft toss and everything. And we're sitting there, we're sitting there, we see all the Cincinnati Reds on the field warming up. I'm sitting there going, oh my goodness, where's Ken Griffey? Don't tell me he's taking the day off. <laughs> this is the one time Trace is going to get a chance to see Ken Griffey play and he's not out there warming up the rest of his teammates. I was just sweating because Trace was like sitting there like he was just, just so high and everything. He, yeah. just, he just kept looking for Ken Griffey. Ken Griffey, where's Ken Griffey? He was that much, uh, that much uh, of a fan of his. But uh, and we had not seen Ken Griffey, not even a dugout. Play, uh, what did they say? As Vince Scully would say, it's time for Dodger baseball. Yeah. Time, time for the first pitch. The first batter's coming up to the plate. I'm looking, no Ken Griffey in the dugout yet. I said, don't tell me he's got the day off. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> we came all this way. This is Trace's one time to see his idol play live because he was just a little kid. And sure enough, uh, Ken Griffey, the first batter comes up, he gets out. Then the next batter on deck walks to the batter's box. And then I see Ken Griffey pop up out of the dugout to get ready to go into the on deck circle. <laughs> I'm like, God. And sure enough, he hit his 538th home run that night. Oh, is that right? I remember, I remember that sweet thing. Say, wow, that's 538. I remember that. Yeah, that dude so did I got that. to see him hit a home run and yeah. see him deliver. So, but, mm-hmm. but I was so relieved that he was going to play. So that's how NBA fans think, too. Right, Looking right. on the floor, uh, why isn't Anthony Davis warming up? Why isn't LeBron warming up? They not playing tonight? Right. You know, that's how they right. would feel, too. Right. No, I, I get it. Believe me. That's why I think we, we are in agree- agreements with the uh, low management. Right. There's no doubt about it. Now, MT, you went from, you know, your playing career, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, to transitioning into the media, basically, and broadcasting. Um, how was that transition for you? Was it as smooth as it looks, or did it, takes a lot, did it take a lot of work or preparation? Kind of tell us how that transition was for you. Smooth as uh, that rum you're drinking right there, my man. <laughs> because, as you know, when you found out when I joined the Lakers, I was the most articulate player on the team. Oh, Not God. only was I the best Oh, looking, my God. I Here we go. I Byron Scott as the best looking player on the team. I supplanted uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I'm telling him I said this. As the most articulate <laughs> on the team. I don't want Cap coming after yeah, me. Cap, you, you always still was oh. taught by Bruce Lee. So. I don't. I don't want to mess with him. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I'm second most articulate on the team next to Kareem. So I figured, you know, Coaching, eh, maybe I should have dabbled in to see if I would like it. But I always knew that once my career was over, I probably want to stick around the game by getting into broadcasting because it was fun talking about the game. This really isn't a job. I can't believe the Lakers pay me for this, to be able to talk about basketball, to go to games, to watch the Lakers <laughs> play and all these other great players play, and I get paid to do this. So that to me, that just felt like a natural transition because I like to talk to the media when I was a player. Right, I right. enjoyed talking to the media. I, didn't, I wasn't uh, anti-media like you and other guys were back oh in those days. Oh, my God. I enjoyed talking to the media because being around you and Coop and Magic and, and Hall of Famers like that, I needed all the attention I could get. Tried to, you know, so come talk to me. If Magic and Byron want to talk to you, I'll talk to you. Yeah, because I, I need the attention. I need, I need the focus because nobody's paying attention to me anyway on this team because of these guys. <laughs> So I like talking to the media. So I thought it was a natural transition for me to, to get out there, be, put me behind a microphone, and let me talk about a game that I love. I, I see you still lying. You, you <laughs> still, I see you still lying. After all these years, you're still lying to the media, still lying to the no. public. Still lying to the public, no, listen, MT. Listen, you're still lying to the public. We, we trying, let you talk. We let you talk when, yeah. when, when it was permitted, and it was time for you to talk. But isn't that ironic, though? The two Bahamians that has played for the Lakers are the best-looking Lakers ever, <laughs> me and Rick Fox. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I'm not going to even go in this with you again. You, you, you can't you, argue about Rick Fox. I, 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 I'm not going to argue about Pretty Ricky. I'm not going to argue about Pretty Ricky at all. <laughs> I like to put myself in the Rick Fox. Yeah, I, I could tell Nobody that too. else is going to do it. I could tell it. I'm sure, I'm sure Julie would do it. She yeah, put you in that category too. So. <laughs> so MT, I mean, you, you've been with the Slake organization for so many years now. And I know you've had so many memories. Mm-hmm. 
Give us a couple of your most fondest memories of being with the with the Los Angeles Lakers organization. Well, nothing compares to winning championships. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. that that trumps anything, that tops anything. Um, if you when you win a championship, that no matter what you do individually, there's nothing better than that. Uh, as far as individual stuff, man, listen, just dressing. I always say that people like that can be kind of crazy. Just dressing and undressing next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> okay, I guess I can leave the undressing part. <laughs> But you got to take your clothes off and put your uniform on. Yeah, yeah, you know? but you can still say just I mean, dressing. Why do you want to say undressing? undressing just say yeah. just, just, okay, just dressing. I mean, I walked into that locker room and, because my locker room is right next to Kareem's. And there's my freaking idol right there, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I mean, I'm in the same locker room with Kareem sitting right next to him. And over the three and a half years we played together, he said hello to me once. <laughs> <laughs> you know how thrilled that was for me? I couldn't believe it. He actually, and he, I think he... Yeah, he used my right name, except Thompson. <laughs> he didn't use my first name. He said, hey, Thompson. You didn't you weren't that close. He didn't think of me that, like that way. But uh, just the fact, just to be around you guys, to be around these champions. Like I said, I've been around Hall of Famers. I played with Clyde Drexler, mm -hmm. with Artis Gilmore. But to be able to play for the Rolling Stones, Rolling Stones, it's like, uh, like the Lakers, it's like going from a garage band to the Rolling Stones. Because <laughs> you, know, you guys were the epitome. You guys were the standard. The Celtics and the Lakers, were, and you had a chance to put on the Laker uniform. Man, I tell you, just putting on just putting on that Laker uniform for the first time that Sunday morning, I was just just felt weird, different, yeah, yeah. special. Well, it was good for us too. Yeah. I tell you that it was it was a marriage made in heaven. I got I got two more things I want to ask you, and and one was an incident. Me and you talked about this earlier. Uh, we used to have Mike Tyson used to come in the locker room. We had Michael jo uh, not Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Muhammad Ali. All these guys would come in the locker room, right? And Mike Tyson comes in the locker room one time. And again, MT is one of those guys that was just talking a whole lot, just always talking, yeah. always talking. And Mike Tyson comes in the locker room and he's looking for shoes. And Mike Tyson wore a size 15, so he's asking everybody for their shoes. And he comes up to me and we had already met a few times. And he, I was like, hey, 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 Mike, Iron Mike, check it out. Uh, that guy over there said, <laughs> he said, Holyfield's going to kick your ass. Yeah. And so... <laughs> And he, he looked, he said, what guy? Michael Thompson. So he walks straight over to MT and stands over here. And, and what did he say to you? What, what did you say? <laughs> and listen, folks, he wasn't kidding. At least I didn't think he was kidding. He wasn't smiling. He had that look in his eyes like he had when he was looking at, uh, like he's staring down a fighter as the referee's giving him in, uh, fighting intro intro introduction, instructions. I tell you, man, I, I don't know. I, I think I almost He scared the shit out of you, oh, didn't he? Oh, heck yeah. Because I... I <laughs> I thought he was serious. What did you say? I think he man? was serious because he said, yeah. yeah, what did you say, motherfucker? Yeah. I mean, just like that. And, right. and, and you was like. I'm a hammer, hammer, hammer. Because and you got to understand, we, were, we are huge boxing fans. Yes. So we were like in the barbershop in the Laker locker room, always talking about fights, always talking about fighters and boxing. And at that time, Holyfield and Ty well, Tyson was the man. Yeah. In 1987, he was the man in boxing. Holyfield was on his way up. And they were talking about those two uh, fighting eventually. And I was a Holyfield guy. I like Mike Tyson. Don't get me wrong. Big fan. But I just thought Holyfield could beat him because he was tough and he wasn't scared and he could take a punch. And plus, the way he, he, it was going to be a fight in the phone booth, I thought Holyfield would have enough guts to beat him. And sure enough, and so we talked about it. That was part of our discussions. <laughs> Tyson walks in the rock room and this guy tells on me. I was so, I couldn't believe Byron oh, did that. I, I like starting shit. So yeah. I, I figured, what the hell? Let me see what you do when he walks up to you. you I know? tell you, folks, I know it's like to be intimidated <laughs> as, and on a different level. I was intimidated playing against Kareem and against Artis Gilmore and Bob Lanier and those kind of players, but this was different because this guy could have, you know, could have hurt me. Yeah. Although I had to reach on Mike, so you never know. Man, get out of here. Don't, don't even go there again. Don't go there again. We know what Mike would have done to you, just like he would have done to everybody else in that yeah. locker room. Oh, uh, final question, MT, is what is a story that you love to tell, but not a whole lot of people know? And it's probably a story that you tell to your know, friends and family, but not a whole lot of people in the general public would know this story. That they, they could be a serious story, a funny story, but what's, give, give us one story that you would love to tell well, to people. It can't be anything that's nefarious or dirty or you know sort of shady. Because, well, you never did that anyway. Yeah, I, so. I, just, I didn't hang out in clubs as a player. I didn't go hang out in the Playboy Mansion. I was invited there as a Laker to go over there, but I never really. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I never. Was, <laughs> so so I've got, I don't have any grotto was, stories. It to was tell. great. I was. I, I. I literally led kind of a boring life for an NBA player. I would go play before I joined the Lakers. I was having thirty-eight minutes a game, Byron. I didn't have time to go party. I was yeah, too tired, yeah, man. Yeah. And I'm not playing against. Uh, uh, what was his name? Jackson Hayes yeah. of the New Orleans Pelicans. I'm right. playing against Kareem one night, Bob the next day, Moses Malone, Artis Gilmore, 
um, Robert Paris. Man. That's the guys who I had to guard. Just Carl some, Malone. Some unbelievable players. Hakeem right Olajuwon, David Robinson, when they came along. So I didn't have time to go out and party and, and, and act like an idiot off the court because I had to preserve my body because of the challenges I had every night mm -hmm. in the NBA. So stories that I could tell that nobody would know, I just would go home. And this is like obviously before uh, we have all the technology today. Just go home and watch HBO or a movie or something and go to sleep and have a nice steak, something to eat. But uh, stories that I, I can have, secret of stories I could tell that not bad, but nobody knows. Not really. I mean, the fact that maybe I got invited to the Playboy Mansion several times and always refused to go. Is that, I guess that's weird. That, that right? is a, that's, that's a yeah, story. Yeah, I guess that's a story. The <laughs> one guy who was single who didn't want to go to the Playboy Mansion. It's, I guess maybe that's it. Hey, hey, guys, you heard it from Michael. He, he was one of the most boring guys yeah. in the NBA back in the day. <laughs> he was, that was just him. Yeah. But listen, we want to thank Michael Thompson for allowing us to come into his beautiful home. So we are off we, we're off lo location today. We came out here to Orange County to, uh, to, to talk to MT, and he allowed us to be in his house. This has been a great visit. MT, always a pleasure, my brother. It's so good, good seeing you. Great to reminisce. It keeps yes. us young. Yes, it does. This is another edition of Off the Dribble with your boy Byron Scott. Until the next time, guys, we'll see you later. Thank <laughs> you.